Greetings, brothers and sisters. So I was doing a voiceover introduction to this video, and it went on. It's like 45 minutes long or more. It's one of my better voiceovers. But instead of putting it at the introduction of this video, I'm going to cover these topics. I get into truth distortion and things I haven't talked about in the past. Um, so I think it's one of the the better ones. So you, know, you can check that out after this portion. I'm just going to leave it the way it is. It's going to sound like I'm, you know, I'm going to say greetings, brothers and sisters, you know, all that stuff, right? But anyways, let's start here. Selena Gomez says, I signed my life away to Disney at a very young age. And so a couple of things about this. I mean, Disney, we know, and, you know, you know and what that sounds like, Disney sounds like the devil, right? <laughs> and you can see her here. She's dressed in red. And she's got one of these choke chains on, one of these, you know, I mean, we see this quite often. You'll see one of these slave collars on one of these celebrity women who is, um, in this case, I mean, she's basically saying she sold her, her life to Disney, you know, or something else that begins with a D, right? And here she is in red wearing one of these slave collars that, you know, restricts your ability to speak and your ability to breathe. I mean all the things that you associate with these Hollywood slaves, right? Also, she looks a little bit dazed there as well. Comedian Trevor Moore of the whitest kid you know fame, dead at age 41. And I thought I recognized his name. He died on August 6th, which is interesting. And again, being only 41 years old. And the reason why I remembered him is I've done a video that he had this video that he did, Trevor Moore, The High Church of the Illuminati. And so this is CAA, which is a which is a celebrity agency that has not only most of these top celebrities, people like Tom Hanks and so many of them who are a part of this agency, but also it's a sports agency that represents a lot of the top athletes. It's three minutes and 22 seconds long. So this is a comedy spoof about the High Church of the Illuminati. And I've shown pictures of this building before. I'll show them now. But these buildings are in as above, so below formation. And then there's all these other aspects to this compound. It has multiple Illuminati eyes in the landscaping. And it's just this evil, <laughs> this like evil um, talent agencies. And one of the top guys that works there is married to Alyssa Milano. And so Alyssa Milano, who is equally stupid and annoying, I mean, she's this blend of stupidity and annoying at the same time, who's, you know, wants to run for political office, is somehow taken seriously by the mainstream media and other people, even though, you know, I mean, she's just lacking in likability and intelligence, and that's probably why, right? Her husband is a part of this agency. So he goes into this agency, and they want to sign him, and he meets with these two dopes who say he has to go and meet with the higher-ups. And so he goes back into this chamber here. Here's a devil face, you know, all the color red here, all the candles, and here's the upper management of CAA with the, you know, Illuminati, eyes wide shut mass. Hi, we're the Illuminati. Hi. They're the Illuminati. So there's a bunch of things here, you know, you can watch this for yourself. Comedy Central is big on um, copyrighted stuff. But they go through all these various aspects of joining the Illuminati, of course. And, you know, there's some jokes in here. It's obviously a comedy spoof. And at the end, he joins the Illuminati, and now he's dead at 41, right? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I think they might be related, right? <laughs> they very well could be related, and, um, you know, it is whatever it is. The official story is he died of an unspecified accident, and so um, sounds Illuminati-related. Quentin Tarantino vowed as a kid never to share a penny with his mom, she was laying into him about his struggles in school and said she said to him, this writer thing that you're doing is over. 
And he said in his mind, he was like, you know, young person, well, if I make any money, I'm not going to share any with you. And he has kept to that, right? <laughs> because, you know, he's Quentin Tarantino. DJ posts stealth pics of Obama's epic birthday party before being forced to delete them. And so um, Obama had a birthday party on Martha's Vineyard, and there's pictures of him not wearing a mask and other people. And you can check that out. I've seen people posting this on Facebook. And so I don't know what the rules there are. Is that in New Hampshire? Where's uh, Maine? Where's Martha's Vineyard's in uh, Massachusetts? <laughs> I should know that. Like. Well, anyways, I don't know what Massachusetts' um, policies are towards masking, but certainly it looks hypocritical. All these celebrities are maskless, right? There's Obama there. Let's down, scroll down. But all these celebrities are maskless. I'm not sure who that is there, but there seems to be a lot of hypocrisy here. So again, I did this some long voiceover that was going to be the introduction, so it's going to sound like I'm restarting the video i'm just leaving it intact because you know i don't know why I'm lazy <laughs> but anyways here it is greetings brothers and sisters um a couple of things to get to here i guess a few things the obama super spreader event selena gomez talking about selling her life to disney and a comedian who trolled uh, the illuminati is uh dead now at age 41 so you know a few things to get to uh, maybe some more stuff i can't remember but anyways i wanted to you know preface this with an introduction i've been thinking about um this idea of confirmation bias where you have an internalized belief system whatever your ego and your whatever it is your psychological makeup believes in your preferences things that you like and identify with which keeps people from seeing the truth. You know, we have a subjective truth. You can have people watch the same movie or see the same issue or whatever it is, right? And they will have complete different interpretation of what they saw. I mean, you know, there's the distortion of reality. And so if you're a truth seeker, ultimately what you're doing, ultimately what you are, you know, trying to accomplish is to minimize or hopefully get rid of your own personal distortion of reality that allows you to fall for things or to you know, be um, swayed in a direction that goes away from God and goes away from your soul's path and all these things, right? See, confirmation bias is where somebody is looking for something externally, information that agrees with they, what, what they already believe in. They're prejudiced, they're pre prejudging of reality and they want things that align with their belief system so they'll seek news sources and people like themselves that validate what you believe on the inside you're looking for things in the in the external world that agree with what you have inside and that's you know a big thing a big realization confirmation bias but what i'm talking about is reality distortion and locating that in your system and really, you know, working on removing your own personal reality distortion. And the problem is it's destroyed the truth community. <laughs> because, you know, without removing reality distortion, there is no personal truth. But it's destroyed the world the way it is now. Because the distortion of reality is growing. And this is, you know, what's behind all mental illnesses, right? People distorting reality more and more so, until it becomes something where a person can't even function in the world because the world, the way they see it, what they're experiencing is so far off from what's really happening that it stands out, right, in some sort of diagnosable pathology. And then, you know, the distortion of reality that each person has, they want other people to view reality the way they view it. They want everyone to have the same distortion of reality they have. And so instead of fixing your own personal distortion of reality, and there's methods to do this, right? There's ways of honing your critical thinking skills and being able to confront your ego and your you know personal belief system. 
and really, you know, develop some sort of mental discipline where you can get rid of your, you know, we can all get rid of our distortion of reality. But what happens is most people want to get rid of everyone else's distortion of reality or make everyone else have the same distortion they have. And that's very prevalent in the truth community. Most people aren't working on changing themselves. They go, look at all these people. How can they believe this? How can they fall for this, right? I mean, how many times have you said that about sheeple or your relatives or people who watch the mainstream narratives and news, and they're saying the same thing about you? How can you believe this? How, you know, right? We have the authority. The authority says, you know, this is reality, and you guys are crazy conspiracy theorists because you don't agree with the official story, which is all distorted reality. I mean, that's, you know, lying, you know, illusions. And so everybody is looking at other people and going, how can you how can you be so stupid to believe in your distorted reality? But very few people confront theirs, right? So this is how it works, you know, in terms of how it's worked or played out in the truth community. That when you're born, you're, you, you grow up in a family and in a school system, a social system, that tells you what reality is. And so you have a belief system, what your parents' morals and ethics are, the way they see the world, their political leanings, right? All the things that, that is part of their distorted reality and their confirmation bias and all these things. And then you have a school system, and maybe you grow up in a religion or something like this, and you're told this is... You know, your religion tells you what God is, and, you know, if you're a Christian, it's the Bible and your Christian tradition, and then, you know, whatever your parents tell you in the school system, and people become patriots, they love America, whatever it might be, and you're told what America is, like you don't get this other points of view and perspectives, and so it just comes from the indoctrination you receive from your parents and the institutions that you grow up in. And those are your fundamental building blocks of your personality. And you experience them as a young kid, right? As a two-year-old, as a three-year-old, as a five-year-old, as a seven-year-old. And so when you start finding out that your parents suck and they're liars and your country is, you know, murderous or whatever, and the religion you belong to has been BSing you forever, right? When you find out all those things, it is very emotionally difficult because when you got that information, you were a very young person, right? Your fundamental building blocks. And so you go back to that age emotionally and you're like a, you know, a young kid. This is a, a lot of you have experienced this and you feel hurt because, you know, you were deceived as an innocent kid and you're emotionally, you know, your emotional intelligence of when you learn that information you revert to that age emotionally and you experience betrayal and you know fear and things about being lied to in this way because you emotionally go back to that original building block it's very difficult for people to rework things that they were given as children if you grow up uh, the more messed up family and environment you grow up in it's very hard for you you know it's very hard for people to rework the fundamental building blocks of their training as a young person and the society and culture that they grow up in, it's very difficult. That's why people, you know, want to find things that agree with those fundamental building blocks and the, you know, the way that your your distorted reality you were given by the powers that be in your life. And so that's one problem that people have because very few people can shed all of their internal wrong programming and distorted reality they were given as a kid. You know, mentally you can be able to sort of see things, but emotionally it's difficult. And those are the fundamental building blocks of your personality. So it's very hard to get rid of those, right? In some way, like they're just buried deep inside you, whether you're aware of them or not. And so that's why the indoctrination of the children, I mean, you can see it right now, that when, you know, the older generations die off, they got these kids. I mean, these kids are, you know, the majority of these kids have bought in completely on every level to the stuff that we are like, you know, shaking our heads at. And that's one of the reasons why it's easy for us, because we grew up with something completely different 
than our children are growing up with. And, you know, because parents spend such little time with their kids and the kids are being raised by the beast and mostly by the internet, I mean, kids are getting most of their interactions on the internet. Kids have been programmed in a way that is global. You know, they can do it nationally instead of having your local programming, right? You live in a a red state, you live in a blue state, whatever it might be, right? But now kids are growing up, you know, connected to a global internet where they have their belief system given to them collectively, right? And so, you know, it's a totally different thing for them. And you can see once they're in power, they believe all this stuff. It's a, you know, it's a lost battle. They, you know, they've been, I mean, it's just happened where parents, um, without really making a conscious decision, just turn their kids over to the internet to be raised. And, you know, the parents are on the internet themselves. So you have a family of people all on different screens and devices in their house, even though they're together, you know, physically, their, you know, mental connection and what they're looking at on the internet, you have right wing truther parents and they're, you know, Trumpers looking at right wing stuff and their kids are watching liberal programming videos, right, or whatever it is, <laughs> video games or whatever it might be, Instagram people and, you know, social media people. And so the kids are getting a complete different belief system than what their parents did and what their parents would have to offer them. And so then you go through a truther process where you start to wake up and you realize your beliefs about the country and the government and all these other things, maybe your religion, maybe, you know, it's usually partial with people. Most people can't do a, a clean sweep, you know, like a, a, a wipe, right? You know, wipe away their old belief system and realize that everything they were told is a lie. And, you know, in one way or another, there's some truth mixed in or whatever. But the general sense of their internal world and what their, you know, their fundamental beliefs are has been, you know, lied to, they've been lied to and indoctrinated. Very few people can get all of it, you know, cleaned or reworked. But people develop some ideas about being lied to by the system. And what's happened to destroy the truth community is you have people who are good at presenting the lies and the hidden stuff, right? The symbolism, all the stuff that's there that you weren't even aware of. There, lots of people are good at presenting the problem. And some of the information you're getting is people just copy other people's research and ideas. I mean, they may not even believe in it themselves if they're a disinformation agent. They're just repeating the, some of the breakthrough, you know. I mean, we all do that to some extent because there's been pioneers in this movement. And, you know, people then piggyback off of that research, right? And so what happens, though, is they're able to tell you there's a problem or, or expose something as a lie using their whatever it is, you know, whatever ideas that are out there in the truth community. It's easy to show that the system is fake and just, you know, lies historically and scientifically and, you know, in terms of religion, all these things. It's easy to expose all the lies in your programming. But then you're like, well, what do, what do I then believe? Because you're saying this thing is all lies, but what's the truth then? And the problem with the truth community is that there's all these theories and ideas put out there. Much of it is, you know, completely made up or even worse, disinformation that's put out there by the intelligence community or whatever, you know, group of deceivers that are out there. But the problem is that people in the truth community just then believed everything, right? That's what happened with the Cubies. The Cubies was the worst example of this, that they were given these little Q drops of information by, you know, a disinformation, a disinformation agent. And then they went on their own, you know, they got their little Q Dakota rings out and they started to search or research things. And people just started to make up all these things about Gitmo and all this stuff about all the things that were being put out there about Hollywood and the elite and all the pervy stuff, right, that was out there. And people believed all of it, right? I mean, it happened with a lot of these stories. It happened with the you know, pizza thing and all these things. 
that there were all these things that were believed that weren't true. And people just started making things up because they thought it would help, I don't know, convince more people or, you know, a lot of times they did it for their own personal, um, they just wanted to be internet celebrities. And so they started to make up more and more stuff and a lot of things that were, you know, not even uh, true or were ideas that could have been true but weren't proven became fact, right? And people just believed whatever independent people are telling them. They're like, well, I can't trust the media anymore, but I can trust some random person in their, you know, in their house on their computer who, you know, may or may not have any sort of journalistic or, you know, moral training or ethical training or be someone with critical thinking skills who's just making things up or, you know, every time somebody saw a symbol, they, you know, whatever it might be, and they're like, oh, that means that, that means this, and things just started to disintegrate from there. Any sort of, you know, idea that there was truth to be to be heard in the truth community was destroyed, and it wasn't just the QBs. This was a problem across the board. People just believe things. Oh, it's in a meme, I believe it. Like, you know, the people who researched it or came up with the original idea, did they do quality research, or were they disinformation agents? Where did this idea came from? Come from? Where we you know what's the source of this information? What's the facts? What's the proof, right? No, no one cared about that. Oh, somebody said it and I must believe it, right? And then people just shared it and especially from the right wing. The problem with the right wing, and you know, there's lots of right wingers, many of you who are listening to this, who look at the left and see how the left has been deceived and you know how arrogant and stupid the left is, you know, the liberals and all this. But you don't, you know, take responsibility for the fact that the right wing built the military industrial complex, the pro war right wing, doing so much damage. The paranoid right wing built these heavy duty, um, you know, the NSA and the CIA and the rest of the intelligence community. They're the ones that wanted all this surveillance. I mean, then things with social media and all these things that all came from right wing people that wanted to spy on other people, wanted to gather information, paranoia, fear-based, warlike right-wing people. And now the left has all those things. The left has the weapons, they're in control of the, the, the NSA, they're in control of the, you know, the, the um, intelligence community, they're in control of the media, all these things that happened with Fox News. Fox News set the example. Fox News used to be way worse than CNN and, and uh, NBC. MSNBC, in terms of their bias, right? You know, Fox News used to say fair and balanced, and it was the the most, you know, unbalanced news. And Fox was killing MSNBC and CNN. And CNN and MSNBC realized that they had to go f- completely to the left. They couldn't try to, you know, be centered anymore. Not that they were centered. They were, there was bias. There was liberal bias, but not as much as the right-wing bias that Fox News was pushing out there. Fox News is, you know, just a, a mess with those. Uh, Roger Ailes and Rupert Murdoch are like just bad people, right? And so CNN and MSNBC said, all right, we're going to go even farther than Fox. And that's what's happened now to the news because Fox set that example. So you have to understand all these right-wing things that happened out there. And then when the QBs came in, they were convinced that the only solution to get rid of all these creepy MNFers in the deep state was to invoke martial law and have secret military tribunals and get rid of all, you know, all these types of your right to due process and things that make America better than other countries. I mean, in terms of, you know, having your, your rights and they wanted to get rid of all our rights and just have the military start grabbing people and give secret military tribunals and lock them up in Gitmo or, or worse, right? They were calling for public execution, these QBs and stuff. And again, I'm not saying QBs were the only people. We all did this, right? We all repeated things that were, you know, not true, thinking they were because we thought someone else did quality research. I mean, in terms of the mainstream media, as limited as it is and as bad as it sucks, they have editors and they police each other, right? You know, they fact check, check each other and then they're, you know, in their own reality. But in terms of the truth community, there was none of that. It was just individual people just posting their opinions or their so-called research 
on the internet and then people just repeated it like it was somehow factually proven. There's so many things out there that I know to be untrue and it's messed up now considering with the censorship that's going on and all the rest of it, like the truth community has been decimated. And so the QBs were the worst example, but all of us fell for it, right? But the you know right-wing people, you have to understand if you came from a right-wing perspective, and I said this about the QBs early on, that it's easy to see the you know the information and the conspiracy theories about like liberals and Democrats, but it's hard for you to see through the Trump stuff. You know, example of this is I got another comment yesterday. I don't know what it was, and the person um, writes um, this is about Britney Spears. Can't really listen to you make fun of someone so broken and abused. And so I've said this over and over again. You have these people, usually right-wing people, Republican-type people, who have a soft spot in their heart for Britney Spears, but who isn't broken. You wouldn't have any problem with me mocking Cardi B or Lady Gaga or Madonna or any of these women you know, who were once abused in a you know, similar way to Britney. They have ways of, different ways of you know, the outcome of that abuse. But it's because of your bias, because you see Britney as a blonde Disney kid, right wing Southern girl, and you, you know, who you have a, a soft spot in your heart for. This is what I've been talking about this whole time, right? But you, you know, have a different view of these other women who all went through similar. I mean, everybody's messed up, everyone's broken to some extent, you know? I mean, you could say, all right. I don't like the way that you mock everybody. I don't like the way that you, you know, you, you make fun of Alex Baldwin and Britney Spears, even though you, know, you don't like the behavior, right? You don't like the mocking behavior, and that's completely acceptable. And I can't say, you know, mocking behavior is a higher level thing. I mean, I'm dealing with just slime and darkness here. And it's my way of coping and making these videos light and also you know, making them more comedic and less, you know, serious and like news oriented, which is helpful in a lot of different ways for the channel. And so that's why I do it. Like you can have a real problem with that and I can totally understand that. But it's when you get subjective and you say, I have a problem with this behavior because the object of the behavior is somebody I identify with. Like I had this with lots of Trump supporters who loved it when I, you know, bashed Biden or said negative things about Biden or whoever, Hillary or whatever it was, but they couldn't, you know, see the same things with Trump, right? They found the stuff I did on one person funny, but then they're like, oh, I'm offended by your behavior when it's about somebody that I, or something I believe in, or somebody I believe in, right? And that's, you know, <laughs> that's you not recognizing your distorted reality. Somebody sent me this, um, this guy, he posts things on TikTok, but he put all the, the clips on into a YouTube video. It was pretty funny. The guy um, is a comedian who, I guess, used to work at IKEA, and he had all these um, you know, funny comebacks for stupid things that customers said to him. And it was humorous. My wife and I enjoyed it. We laughed at it. But then I looked for more of his stuff, and he's pro-Voldemort, right? And he had the same sort of bit that he did for people who are, you know, not pro Voldemort. And it wasn't as funny. It wasn't funny at all, right? Because, you know, one thing was funny because it was something that is similar to what I do in the comic videos, but the same bit done to something that was, you know, and the way he did it too was really bad. Like, I'm like, oh, I, I dislike this person, right? And so, you know, we all have that, right? We all have our internal preferences. You know, people are like, oh, that's, you know, I don't have a problem with that behavior until that behavior is targeted at something that you love or you like, right? People aren't opposed to trolling, but then don't want to get trolled, right? Oh, you're so mean. And so this is the real aspect of being a, a truthful person where you see your, you know, your confirmation bias, your own distorted reality, the distorted lens in which you see the world. And you confront that and change that. And you seek the truth truly. Like not, you know, not the truth that's palatable to you. The truth that agrees with, 
your belief system. I mean, that's the whole reason the QB thing went so south is because Q said exactly what they wanted to hear. And then the other, you know, QBs that did research and put out information all agreed with their far right wing lens in which they viewed the world. You had these extreme right wing people that were dissatisfied with the world. And this stuff that was put out, this, you know, anonymous stuff, the Anons, right, all this stuff they put out there, and Trump as well, told them what they wanted to hear. And so, you know, this is a lesson for all of us, right? How bad the QBs got played and rolled and, you know, conned and swindled and the Trumpers as well. I mean, Trump sold everybody out after January 6th. He brought all those people up. He riled them up. He sent them down Pennsylvania Avenue. He told them to go let the people at the Capitol hear them, right? And then when they went in and they, you know, did whatever they did and whatever, you know, happened there, he completely bailed on all those people and took no responsibility for it, right? I mean, Trump will always take care of Trump. And so all these people that said Trump was like the reincarnation of Jesus and things like this, you know, because you wanted to believe. And all of us want to believe to some extent. I mean, it's easier for us to believe truth or stuff than it is to believe the mainstream media. You know, we use our critical thinking skills on the mainstream media and then use our distorted reality and our confirmation bias on things that are being said in the truth community. And time and time again, I hear things or people send me things. I'm like, yeah, you know, that's probably not true, or at least it's being exaggerated and overstated. And, you know, so many people believe in it. I see it all the time. I mean, it's, you know, it's a plague on the so-called truth community because it's not that easy. Like, you know, it, it, you're very seldom going to have something that the truth is going to align with what you perceive it to be, that agrees with what your fundamental building blocks of your personality are. You have to give things up in pursuit of the truth. You have to get stung, right? Things that you hold dear, people that you look up to, institutions that you believe in are going to be shown to you in a complete different light, right? Every spiritual organization, every religion, there are things that if you could see parts of the, you know, the master's life or the saint or whatever it is, savior, like if you if Christians could see parts of Jesus's life and some of the things that he engaged in, or, you know, for Hindus, Krishna or Rama or Buddha for Buddhists or Muhammad for, um, you know, people in uh, Islamic people, if they could all see parts of the, you know, the low parts and mistakes and thoughts of these spiritual people, because they all have their, you know, moments that are scrubbed by your religion they don't talk about or they don't even know about. But if you interact with somebody like this in real life, you're going to see their humanness at times. And it's going to cause doubt. It happens in the heartfulness meditation with the masters of the system. They have their own personality, their personal bias, and they have their own, you know, mistakes they make and, you know, things that they don't get right or whatever. They have their, you know, moments of anger and doubt and whatever, right? Their egotistical moments. Every saint, every spiritual being has their low moments. And so if you were going to judge the person just by those moments and not by their spiritual greatness or their accomplishments or their high moments. That is what, you know, people are, you're just told about the high moments and so that you think those are the only things that exist. But everybody has to confront things and change their minds about things and, you know, have the, you know, things that rattle you and shake you because they're things that you, you know, believed when you were a young person. Because the ego, when you're distorted truth gets confronted and you realize you've been distorting reality, it makes you feel not good, right? It makes you feel like, you know, you can't even trust yourself. And so this happens to people all the time. And, you know, oftentimes God, when you have a relationship with God, will tell you or not even tell you because it's not that, you know, it's not that aggressive. You're not given orders for the most part. You're given, you know, God shows you things and allows you to decide. I mean, God doesn't force anybody to do anything. But God, when you have a relationship with God, God will show you something or, you know, communicate something in a very subtle way because your heart is very subtle and love is very subtle. And this is, you know, the, the transmission that's given the heartfulness meditation. And you're shown things in a very subtle way 
and it makes you feel not so great. And, you know, you're like, I don't want to do that. Right. I mean, that's how I am. Like there's been a bunch of things, even starting the heartfulness meditation. I didn't want to do heartfulness. You know, what happened was I was going through a transitional period in my life. I just turned 29 and, you know, I went to this Vedic astrologer. There's a, a different form of astrology called Vedic astrology. They have, it's, um, it's a better astrology than the, you know, traditional Greek astrology or whatever it is, but it is, um, it's not complete. A lot of it's been lost. But anyway, so I went to this guy who was a Vedic astrologer, and he said, you know, I had this horrible Rahu period, which is a dark planet from the time I was 10 until the time I was 28. And then you have your, you know, Saturn returns every seven years, and that has an effect on your system. So every seven years, you're reborn on a cellular level. And so 28 is a significant year, right? You have these, you know, seven years old is a significant um, 14 years old is significant, 21 is significant, and 28 is significant. There are times of changes, right? You know, when you're seven and eight years old, you go from things happen in your brain where you stop being like a toddler, right? You're, you know, a small child, you're a toddler, five, six years old, kindergarten, and then you turn seven, you become a kid. Like you're no longer, you know, in the toddler realm. You've grown out of that realm when you're six, seven years old, seven, eight years old, right? Right. And then when you're 14, you go through puberty. I mean, now it's much younger, but that was a time when you became a teenager. Then you're 21, you become an adult, you're full grown. Most people are full grown by the time they're 20, 21 years old, right? 18, whatever it is. And you become an adult. And then 28, you enter into that, you know, next phase, right? So these, you know, seven year cycles are really important. But anyways, you know, so I was going through this transition where, I was done with my partying days, you know, drinking alcohol and using, you know, whatever it was. I was done with my partying, you know, part of my life and my sports stuff. I, had, you know, aspired to be, uh, you know, do something with my athletic ability and it really didn't pan out. But I played in a lot of various leagues and hung out with guys who, you know, were on my sports teams. And they were all like, you know, I had um, we had a YMCA a basketball team that was in a very competitive league with a lot of ex-college players. I guess there were some ex-pro players in there as well. And so it was a very, you know, high-level basketball league. And we had, you know, a good team. And every once in a while, one of the guys would, you know, get married, hook up with a, like a girlfriend that was, you know, their future wife, and they would just disappear, right? They would graduate and get a real job or whatever it was. And they would just disappear, right? And we were like, ah, you're whooped, right? You know, like we all, you know. We're just hanging on to our youth. And all of that stuff got old for me. Like I couldn't do it anymore. I wasn't really interested in sports as much as I used to be. I didn't really want to go to bars and drink. I just couldn't, you know, and I hadn't found a career or anything to do with my life. And, you know, I didn't move up to the next stage of my, you know, development. And I was really frustrated. And so I was um, living with this uh, with this woman who was, you know, we were more friends. We had been engaged for a while and we were, you know, together, but we became more like roommates and we, you know, we were in the process of breaking up and we, you know, we got along real well, but there was no real passion or future in our relationship. And she went to, she went into therapy with a woman that lived like, you know, a couple of blocks down the street from us. Right. And so eventually, you know, my girlfriend said, Hey, you should probably go see this woman too. She's great. She's really nice and insightful. And this therapist was someone who was a professional licensed therapist with an MSW, like she could accept insurance, but she also was a spiritual person that was a medium that could like channel like, you know, whatever, what she called her like spirit guides or whatever, which is sometimes, you know, bad, but in this case, she was good at it. She was definitely connected to a higher level consciousness. I mean, I had proof of it, and so I went and saw her for, I don't know, a year or something, right? My, you know, my girlfriend and I broke up and, you know, and I realized she helped me realize that my old life was over. It was, you know, this stuff I had just been talking about, my partying days and all these other things like that was done, which, you know, I, uh, I recognized that, but then there wasn't something else that took its place. Like I was like in this stagnant position and no, nothing was opening up. So you know, I stopped seeing this uh, counselor and I, you know, my, my ex-girlfriend and I went our separate ways and I moved up to, um, 
you know, Massachusetts from Connecticut. And so I was about an hour and a half away from where we used to live. And I, you know, was just really angry and frustrated because nothing was opening up. Like something closed, the door closed behind me on my old life and nothing opened up in terms of a new life. So I went back and saw this um, counselor and I was really irritated. I'm like, you know, what good is it to know that your life sucks if something else doesn't open up for you, right? You know, this happens to a lot of people in the truth community where you, know, you can't go back to your old life, but nothing opens up that's better or, you know, you know, a step in like an evolutionary type of way, right? Where you evolve into a higher level of being, right? Consciousness and, uh, you know, a new way of living. And so I went back. I hadn't seen her about three months or whatever. We didn't really have a closing type of a session. And so I was completely frustrated. And her spiritual guy said he should meditate, right? That was what, you know, her feedback was. And she handed me this, um, you know, it was like a, a Xerox piece of paper. And it was not even like done well. It was like, you know, hard to read. And it had stuff about what's now called heartfulness, Saj Marg, right? And she says, yeah, I tried this thing and it's really good. Maybe you want to try it. And she handed me this piece of paper and it really made me angry. Like I was not happy with it because I had tried to meditate before and I disliked it. I was very restless. I had done some yoga with meditation, physical yoga, because I wanted to, you know, enhance my basketball playing abilities. So it was a physical thing, you know, Hatha yoga. And there was some meditation with it. I took these classes and I didn't like the meditation, you know, for the most part, right? You know, and I, I didn't really want to pursue meditation. And I, I really hated the answer that I was given. And so I remember driving home being really frustrated and angry. Like, you know, the session didn't go well. It was uncomfortable. And, you know, and I felt a little bit like sort of, I don't know, cheated, you know, because I was consciously aware of how bad things sucked. But in my old, you know, way of being, but there was nothing else to open up to take its place, right? And so I, you know, I went home, I had this desk, and I threw the piece of paper on top of it. And three months went by. And, you know, I picked it up, and I felt vibrations in my heart. I looked, I was going to throw it away, and I reread it or something. And I felt this pleasant sensation in my heart. And I was reading it, it said, oh, this is about your heart, you meditate on your heart. And I was like, you know, I could feel it. I'm like, oh, you know, even though I was completely closed to meditation and I didn't want to do it and, you know, I wasn't interested in God or any of these things, right? I wasn't interested in a spiritual life. I didn't, you know, have any conscious on an egotistical level desire to embark on a spiritual journey and really didn't know much about India and these things that, you know, were a part of it or whatever. And so I was like, yeah, I'm not interested in that. Like this is, you know, I dislike this answer. Like I want something tangible in my material life to change. I want, you know, things to open up in terms of a career and in terms of a, you know, healthy relationship with a woman that would, you know, lead to, you know, family and things like this. I mean, I wanted something substantial, you know, that was different and better than my old life to open up. I didn't want anything, you know, etheric. I wasn't looking for a spiritual change, but I felt something when I read the piece of paper. And then I just kind of felt like, hey, I think something's good's going to happen. Like I just have this sense that maybe this thing was going to, you know, work out for me. <laughs> you know, I mean, back then, I mean, I, I can't even describe the differences between me now and me then. But I, um, you know, called the guy up and he said, well, you can come over, you know, and, and it, you had to get three um, individual, what I now know is called sittings, right? But, you know, I thought it was like called sessions back then, where you sat in front of a trainer and they would clean your heart. And I didn't even know, like, this is, you know, what I know now. But I didn't know that then. And then this transmission, the you know, this energy that's given in the heartfulness system was given, right? And it poured on all three days. So this is um, going back to August 3rd, which was uh, the third day where you, you know, get the third sit, where I got the third sitting and became what's called an abiyasi, a spiritual aspirant of the heartfulness system. And it isn't, you know, like you get a, a badge or, a, you know, a, an ID or stuff. I mean, they have that in the, the system. You can get a, you know, some sort of like a membership card. So it makes it easier when you go to gatherings for them to find you in the system, right? When you register and things like that. 
But that's not what's important. What's important is that you have these introductory spiritual experiences of these sittings, and I knew none of that, right? And it poured, and I didn't know in, until like 25 years later when I was in India, and there was these big gatherings, and they said, yeah, it always rains at these big gatherings, even if the gatherings were at a time when there's usual drought, because there's, a, there's a, a wet season, a typhoon season in India, and then there's a lot of drought. But also in other parts of the world, where people are meditating at these gatherings, very often it would rain. And Master Charvi said, yeah, that's a, a physical manifestation of the divine grace that's falling, you know, that's falling down into these gatherings, right? I was at um, Master Charvi's birthday celebration. You know, he was, um, like, it was his last one while he was alive. He was, you know, he wasn't there because he was, he was too sick. And it rained so bad that the tents, these temporary tents, flooded out, right? And then people are saying, yeah, it always rains at these gatherings. And it wasn't a time of the year where there would be a lot of rainfall. And so there was, you know, like a typhoon. I mean, a level of, like there was three or four inches of rain on the ground. It was a muddy mess and whatever. And there's like fifteen to 20,000 people there, some of them sleeping there. And it's all wet. It's just, you know, a whole thing. And so I went to get these individual sittings and it was pouring rain. So it was like the right time for me, right, because of this you know, this, the, it, what rain signifies in the heartfulness system in terms of this transmission. And so I went over to this guy's house, and he's kind of a weird guy, right? He's a, you know, he had been a little bit older than me, you know, a, the earlier generation. I'm Generation X, and he was a boomer, and he grew up in the, hip, in the hippie movement and had gone to India to seek, you know, spiritual enlightenment and things. And he was completely kind of different as a person. And somebody who was great for me, and I, I've come to like love and appreciate that first year I went over his house and got these individual sittings, and he told me stories about going to India and Babaji and Master Chargy and things like this. And so, um, but when I first met him, like he's kind of a little bit weird, and he said, you know, we're going to sit across from each other, and we're going to close our eyes and meditate. And I'm like, that's kind of weird. Like, I'm like, you know, like, <laughs> like I, yeah, it doesn't like something. You know, I was like, all right. You know, but I had felt the thing in my heart. I'm like, all right, I'm going to do this, right? I already, you know. I just felt a sense of this, you know, something good was going to happen. And I remember, like, you know, you're supposed to meditate on the supposition of divine light in the heart. And I was, you know, doing that, but I wasn't really doing it right. And I was like, oh, I suck at this. You know, <laughs> like the first meditation. I'm like, oh, this sucks. And it's kind of uncomfortable. And, I, you know, I'm aware of the other person sitting across from me. And I'm like, oh, you know, I was almost like, all right, I'll just do this and, you know. And then at the end, I had this profound experience, like my face and my jaw like tightened up and it felt like somebody reached in through like my mouth and my, you know, like on a, like a, not on a physical level and something was being pulled out of my chest, like just something was being removed. Like I just, um, it was a, like an intense experience, like, you know, my muscles and my jaw tightened up and it was like something was being ripped out of me. And then when it was like gone like something heavy was removed, and I just experienced this lightness. And you don't receive transmission till the third sitting, but I experienced this deep laughter, just deep joy. I really can't describe it, but this overwhelming sense of well-being, I was like, oh, the, you know, and I, I had this deep internal laugh, right? And it happened the other two individual sittings, the same thing. And the last one was the best, right, in terms of like this deep laughter. And I was so psyched. Like, you know, I realized that finding God inside internally and this internal process, you know, it was like the joke and the, and the, you know, the setup line, the straight line was, you know, all the crazy materialistic pursuits of people, you know, to be, you know, important, to be famous, to be, you know, successful. And the real reason that you're here is inside you. And it was, you know, and it, I mean, it doesn't sound funny as a as a joke, but as a feeling, like I laughed, like I had this deep, like inner laughter. I was just, you know, completely blissed out. Had I not had that experience, I probably wouldn't have stuck with it, right? I wouldn't, you know, I was it was too foreign to me, and and then I went to group meditation. It was mostly old hippie people, and I didn't have as good experience in the group meditation, but I, you know, had already had this great experience. And, you know, and I've had these great experiences over and over again that are, you know, confirmation of the system. 
And then I've changed, right, and, you know, become more loving and things like this. And so the system works. But on an egotistical level, in terms of dealing with the organization, in terms of, you know, all kinds of things that I want to go, to go into, frustrations I've had with heartfulness on an ego level, I would have quit the thing a thousand times if it didn't work. You understand this? But I've had to deal with it, right? Some of those things that were, you know, that hurt my, you know, that were, uh, you know, brushed up against my ego in a way or whatever, turned out to be, most of them turned out to be blessings, cleanings, and things that happened, helped me mature and, you know, helped me evolve. I mean, things that were unfair on, on the material level, but they helped on the spiritual level. And so, you know, that's why I've stuck with heartfulness, because it works, not because it's something that is congruent with my fundamental, you know, building blocks of my personality, my confirmation bias and my distortion of reality. In fact, it's against all those things, right? My, you know, those things have all been triggered by, by doing the heartfulness system. And so if it was up to my ego, I would have quit a long time ago. And another example of this is, you know, my family and I were in a desperate state in India. My, you know, ex and I were about to, you know, split up and go our separate ways. And the family was in crisis and, you know, all these things were happening. And, you know, I was going through deep cleaning and all these negative things were coming up. And, you know, I've talked about this in the past. And I knew that I was being instructed by God to go into this YouTube channel and, you know, allow it to grow and things like this. I mean, it had been small forever and it was starting to grow. And I knew that I was supposed to do this work that I'm, you know, I've evolved into doing here and now. But back then it was, you know, there's probably 15,000 subscribers and a couple of big videos and things. And so, and I also needed a way to support the family and I needed to turn it into something that was financially viable, right? And so I had this moment where I'm like, all right, I'm looking through the analytics program. YouTube has a good analytics program where you can look into your channel and get, you know, valuable information. And I looked at my top 10 videos, you know, because I didn't even understand this, but my top 10 videos were all celebrity related. And I'd only made, you know, I had the channel for I guess seven years, and most of the stuff was on homesteading and then some other things. But I'd only made like, you know, 10 videos that were more pop culture because I didn't like making them. You know, I thought, you know, I'll, I'll do a few of them. You know, I, I didn't mind making one a month, right? <laughs> one every couple of months. And so I looked at them and I realized they were the ones that were making the channel grow. And of course, I've talked about that since then. I didn't understand it then but I've realized how people's consciousness is and that to reach people with this spiritual information, I was going to have to dive into the cesspit of Hollywood, you know, culture, the Hollywood celebrity culture, you know, and I had this experience of, I mean, God was showing me this, the pressure of my life and, you know, what had to happen. And, you know, I had all this information to share on various subject matters that, you know, needed an audience it needed to come out, right? I needed to do this work. And I had to, you know, go into the Hollywood cesspit, which I felt so much like better than, you know, like it was so, so much beneath me to dive into it. But God showed me it was what I needed to do, right? I just, you know, and I was pissed off about it. I didn't like it, right? You know, I was like, really? You know, but God didn't order me. It wasn't like I was forced, you know, to do this. It was something that I was shown and I accepted it, right? It's become easier and more enjoyable. It used to take me about a day and a half or, or two days to put together like a 20 minute video. I mean, in terms of, you know, my technological ability, but even my ability to talk like I am now has improved. And so just to put out 20 minutes of content took me a day and a half, two days. And it was, you know, very um, labor intensive. And so I used to do celebrity videos. It was way worse. It just sucked. It was, you know, I mean, I could never do that again the way I do it. I did it. And then, you know, now I couldn't do that uh, the way I used to do it, but I accepted it. Right. And even though it went against my, you know, personal, you know, confirmation bias or what I preferred or my, you know, whatever it was, my ego or whatever, you know, I, I wanted the thing to go in a different way. I wanted to do different kinds of videos, but God showed me and I, you know, accepted it. And now I'm grateful for it. Right. It, working on gratitude. That's what I've you know, learn to do. I was learning to do it then and I've 
become much better at it, accepting things that, you know, didn't appeal to me, and then later on finding out they were blessings. And this has been a blessing. And the heartfulness system has been a blessing. But both of those things, those are just two stories of many stories of times that I had to confront my own distorted reality and my own preferences and my own prejudice and do something I didn't want to do that turned out, you know, because uh, my internal process and my connection with God and my soul were saying, you know, you, you need to do these things, not ordering me, right, showing me. I mean, this is kind of the beauty of the heartfulness system. There isn't like, you know, dogma in the way they have in religions and there's not so much like do's or don'ts and not so much like imposed discipline from the organization, but you're shown things, you know, through the practice and God communicates you to you and you know what you have to do, even though you don't want to do it. Right. Like you're like, yeah, all right. I see it. You know, and you know, your materialistic life, your material life, your material experiences will also send you feedback and you know what you have to do, even though oftentimes it's not what you prefer. It's not your first choice, but once you do them, you feel a lot better. And that's what the truth community is lacking because people just want to, you know, have their internal belief system stay intact and they're just looking for information that supports that. So this is a real long introduction. I mean, this is, I think this is one of my better voiceovers. So I'm going to put this at the end of the video now, <laughs> but I'll just leave it the way it is. And, um, you know, but I think this idea of distorted reality and all the other aspects of the things that I had some sort of insight in my meditation the last couple of days is really important for everybody in the world, but particular, particularly to people who you know, claim to be truth seekers. Because you can't be a truth seeker unless you confront your inner distortion and the things that you want to believe, even if they're not true. Only spirituality will save this world. It's Paul Romano definitely reporting for the Apocalypse and the Ascension. Everyone have a blessed day and be grateful.